Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is my Forbes colleague, staff writer Zach Everson. Zach, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on again, Brittany. Appreciate it. Of course, I had to bring you on midweek because there is so much political news, and I'm really hoping you can break down some of those larger topics with us. I will be happy to try. Great. Well, let's get started. Let's first start on Trump's legal troubles. Last week, a judge ruled former President Donald Trump and his co-defendants have to pay $364 million in the New York civil fraud case. First, give us the basics here. What do we need to know? Well, uh, the basics is, starts off, and that's a lot of money. Um, his share and his company's share is $354.9 million, but he also owes pre-trial pre interest, which is bumps it up to $450 million, and then he has to continue to pay interest on it as well uh, until it's paid, so there's another $87,500 per day that he's racking up there. So that is a lot of, uh, of money there. And then, of course, he also owes E. Jean Carroll $83.3 million from that lawsuit. So, like you said, a lot of money, over $400 million to be exact. And Forbes does estimate that Donald Trump is a billionaire, uh, $2.6 billion, I believe. And um, But simply put, this is a lot of money. Is he able to afford this? Probably, uh, but it's not going to be super easy for him. By our latest estimates, he has a little bit over $400 million in, in the liquid ca in cash and liquid assets. But that doesn't mean he can just immediately take all of that money. You know, he's still going to need, uh, you know, need some money to operate his businesses. So he's going to have to look for some other sources there. Um, there's the possibility that he might try to sell something, um, which he historically has not liked to do and may not be the best time to do it right now because people would know it'd uh, be a bit of a fire sale. It's, you know, every, everybody knows out there that Donald Trump is in need of cash. Uh, and then he could also get a loan, but it would not be able to come from most banks because the, uh, he's not allowed to do business with banks that are registered in New York City. So that's going to preclude, um, at least in New York, and that's going to preclude a lot of his traditional lenders as well. So he might need uh, you know, some wealthy benefactor to, uh, to help him out here. I do want to get into his other legal troubles, but a day after this ruling on Saturday, he went to Philadelphia. He made an announcement at SneakerCon. He was unveiling a new line of sneakers. One of the sneakers, a pair was worth $399. The other two are worth $199. What do you make of the timing of this and the sneakers? Is this at all surprising? Uh, after Trump stakes, nothing is surprising. Um, you know, and, and they sold out. The $399 ones sold out. The super limited edition gold ones. I have to admit, I kind of like them. Uh, they look like something Apollo Creed would have worn in Rocky IV. I'm not saying I would actually wear them or that I bought them, but... You know, they're kind of interesting. So it's it's not surprising at all that Trump's doing this. I mean, we're talking the guy who also, you know, shredded the suit that he wore to his uh, indictment in Atlanta and sold them with trading cards. So not not surprising at all. Now let's pivot to his different legal challenges. The first time he will go on trial for the criminal cases against him will be in March. And this is the hush money case in New York. What do we need to know here? Um, it is the return of the Stormy Daniels trial. Uh, Stormy Daniels, rather, who is, you know, was a big name that we were looking at know, five or six years ago in Trump world. And then she kind of took a back seat to the rest of these uh, his rest of his legal problems. But uh, we're about to deal with it front and center uh, pretty soon. Front and center next month. And he was indicted on 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. How serious is this, Zach? Uh, he could face up to $170,000 in fines and 136 years in prison. So uh, that sounds serious. Um, on the other hand, it's not expected that he would get prison time because this would be his first conviction for this. Is this kind of what legal experts are saying? Potentially no prison time, but how will this impact the 2024 election? Because we have not seen any movement in the polls. Actually, his base has solidified. Talk us, uh, talk us through that. Uh, nothing matters is the, you know, TLDR right here or executive summary or whatever you want to call it. Uh, his base is his base and they're not going anywhere. And he's, you know, we've seen that for years right now. So, um, you know, the election's largely going to come out to, uh, to turn out, you know, assuming these two, you know, Trump and Biden are in fact the two candidates come election day. Um, yeah, it's going to be turnout in a few counties scattered across seven or eight states. 
Um, just about six months ago or so, you had a tracker of all of Trump's lawsuits, investigations, legal troubles. What else should we be looking out for now? Uh, I still think the most serious ones are the uh, the ones that the special counsel is looking at in terms of the uh, federal election subversion and the holding of, of the treatment of um, classified documents. I think those are probably the most serious issues right now. They're a little bit further down the line chronologically than some of these other cases, but I think those are the ones that uh, that may have the largest impact. I do now want to move on down to Georgia. News out of there last week. There was a hearing in Fulton County over whether District Attorney Fawny Willis should be disqualified from Trump's Georgia election interference case over allegations she had an inappropriate relationship with the lead prosecutor on the case. What do we need to know here? Um, we're just kind of waiting to see right now for a judge to make his decision on whether that should be the case. Um, if, if legal experts seem to think it, it doesn't rise to the point where she should be taken off the case, uh, if she is, though, it's something that could delay that case as a new prosecutor would have to be selected, and that, that could take months. And then that new prosecutor could also decide just to drop the case. I heard a, um, a commentator call this or describe this hearing as soap opera-esque. What were your takeaways from the hearing? Oh, it's thoroughly entertaining. You know, as somebody who has C-SPAN on most of the time, this was uh, this was a lot juicier and a lot more interesting. Um, you know, she was an interesting witness, um, and I don't have the legal background that she does, obviously. But I would imagine that somebody who's a prosecutor knows how what to say on the stand that would make them look good and would make them look not so good. And certainly in the court of public opinion. Uh, she didn't come out looking all too good for that, too good out of that. But at the end of the day, you know, the court of public opinion doesn't really matter here as to what the judge is going to decide. But it uh, certainly was entertaining. It was entertaining, to say the least. We saw her testimony. We saw Nathan Wade's testimony. When you look at those uh, next to each other, how strong is this case against her? Is there any indication either way if she's going to be disqualified or not? Uh, there hasn't been any indication. It's largely who is the, the judge going to trust, the, the two of them or the uh, Willis's ex-friend who made the allegations. So we don't really know for sure one way or the other. Obviously, the um, court of public opinion here who's watching, although they might, might, may not have a say here, they will have a say in the 2024 election. What do you think this does specifically for Donald Trump? Yeah, I don't think it really matters one way or the other. You know, it's it's such a small part of his entire legal problems there. Um, you know, I, I will give that a little bit of a caveat that Georgia is obviously a bit of a swing state there. So, you know, even just a minor change in public opinion in Georgia may may influence things there. Um, but I, you know, if you like Trump, you're on board with all this stuff already. The allegations of this relationship, do you think the optics here work in his favor? Yeah, I mean, the optics flat out suck. Um, they're terrible. It's 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 something that just you know whether or not it, it should disqualify her for these cases. Uh, it's you know just just basic business ethics. Like don't do that. Um, so you know it helps, and that's that's one of the things Trump regularly does to defend himself is that he will you know make accusations about the people accusing him, and you know here here he did it. And he's got something juicy to go on. So um, you know it does certainly help his um, you know give his supporters some sort of retort they can make on social media. But beyond that, if it's going to really affect anything, I, I don't think so. Let's now pivot to talk about his contender, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. In a speech on Tuesday, she pledged to stay in the race. Let's ask point blank. Does she have a shot? Um, I think it's a great decision on her part to keep running. Uh, you know, Trump is a 77 year old man who has not prioritized his diet and fitness over the years. And he's facing a heap of legal problems. Why not just continue to run? There's nobody else out there running. You know, if he were to drop out of the race for whatever reason, she's in a better position to get that nomination than anybody else. And you know, if she if she were to drop right at, drop out now, you know, she can't go back and kiss the ring and you know hope for a good job in the in the second Trump administration. That ship has sailed. So why not? You know, if she doesn't have anything else going on, uh, you know, might as well stick around and, and continue to campaign out there and be an alternate and. You know, at some point, the Republican Party will move past Donald Trump. And, you know, maybe in four years, Nikki Haley looks really good for being the only candidate willing to stand up to him for this election. 
Let's talk about that a little bit, because in that speech specifically, she said, I'm not kissing the ring. People are saying or wondering if I stayed in just to be VP. She laughed that off, saying like basically intimating that that's not happening. But how does this benefit her politically? I was talking to pollster Frank Lenz yesterday, and he was saying that she um, since she tr the Republican Party right now is so focused on Donald Trump, it is not Nikki Haley. But in four years from now, both the Republican Party is has to move away from Donald Trump as a person, at, just like the Democratic Party's moving away from Joe Biden. So is there any indication of what the future of the Republican Party looks like? Is Nikki Haley the future? Uh, the future of the Republican Party is probably going to be a hot mess as you've got all these, uh, you know, kind of Republican warlords contesting to take over the party post Trump. When that happens, though, who knows? And I think Haley has done a good job playing this to a way where she's, you know, solidified a base there as being the person who is willing to stand up to Trump. Whether that's enough to carry her, you know, politically in the future, who knows? But I, I think it's a savvy move on her part. She really, I don't see any benefit for her dropping out. There, there's really nothing there. So keep running. Over the weekend is South Carolina's pr uh, primary. We know that she's from there. She's the former governor. Do you think she has any chance of upsetting in South Carolina? No, I mean, not based on what I've looked at. You know, it's, it's South Carolina is, is as Trumpy as they get. And and I, I, I don't see her sort of winning that. I mean, maybe I'll be surprised on that, but I, I think it's Trump, especially right now where it just seems like it's, it's fate accomplished that he is going to be the nominee and people like to back a winner. You know, they don't want to go ahead and vote for somebody who doesn't stand a chance. And I think that I think he's going to have this easily. Let's change topics just a little bit. Let's move on to Wednesday. James Biden, the president's younger brother, testified to the House Oversight Committee behind closed doors. What do we need to know here? Um, this is part of the House Oversight's efforts to impeach uh, President Joe Biden over allegedly uh, sketchy business deals with with Chinese investors. Um, and you know, they believe James Biden and Hunter Biden, uh, the president's son, are involved in that. So they've been they've been interviewing them behind closed doors. House Republicans have been trying to connect President Biden and to his family business dealings. I was talking to uh, Republican members of Congress last year over this very topic. Is there any there there? Not that I've seen. And I would imagine if there is really a there there, you know, that there would have been presented on, on Fox News, you know, as soon as it appeared, you know, I, I don't see them withholding any sort of evidence that would damn the president um, for whatever reason, you know, the integrity of the investigation or whatever. Um, so I suspect there's not much, not much there. Um, I could be wrong, but, uh, you know, we haven't heard of anything that's that's really damning. Back, I want to get your take on some news coming out of New York last week. We saw Democrats flip George Santos's old seat in New York. So is the Tom Swasey victory here a bellwether for Democratic success come 2024 in the presidential elections and then down ballot? Uh, you know, sticking with the, the theme of this interview um, now, I don't think it really matters in terms of being a bellwether at all. Uh, it's a seat that's gone back and forth between Republicans and Democrats over the years. Swazi held it before. Santos was able to get elected to it in part because Swazi didn't run for re-election. So I don't, I don't think it really is indicative of any sort of massive upswell of, of Democratic power. Um, where it does matter, though, would be on the Republicans' precarious hold of the House and that they just you know, lost one more seat in that. Within the past two weeks, we've seen big events for both uh, front runners here, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, Trump and his legal issues and President Biden and the special counsel's report on his handling of classified documents. As you and I sit here right now, we're a little over eight months away from Election Day. Do any of these issues matter then and how much do they matter now? You know, sticking with the theme, if, if you don't like Joe Biden, that uh, that special counsel report was just raw meat. And if you do, you're you're out there making excuses for him. And there are a lot of people who don't like <laughs> supporters of either either side really like nuanced takes on this. I thought John Stewart has returned to uh, Comedy Century's The Daily Show nailed it, you know, when it's saying like this is not good. Um, and you see that he kind of suffered a, the wrath of the of the left. So, yeah, I, I think it's not a great look, but I, I don't think it's really going to matter one way or the other. I mean, it basically confirmed what I think a lot of people would suspect and what we've seen in the news that, you know, senior citizen is having some memory issues and acting like a senior citizen.
And what about Trump's legal issues? Do you think they're going to follow him through November? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not going to go away by any stretch, even if he does win the election. Um, you know, a lot of these are happening in state court and there's nothing he could uh, do with, with those. So it's these are going to continue. Zach Everson, thank you so much for breaking it all down for us. I will talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me again.